What the fuck? Yes. What? Remember when we first met John McClain? Our guy picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Alice. And with a little help from Alan, John McClain kicked out. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we ask Were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you caught yourself thinking? Why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you even know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, then this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Carrie Gross, and alongside me are my two co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert. Good evening. And our special guest from the podcast, One Headlight, Drew. Baby, you make me wish I had three hands. (laughs) I thought you were going to go with Welcome to Mars. (laughs) I was. It was either that one or the uh, when you hear the crunch, you know you're there. Mm, that's a good one. Good either, one. Either I one. like to use your head, you dumb bitch. Anyway, <laughs> each week we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. Each week, the audience selects from six movie choices that we break out our race car VHS tape rewinder and watch the movie that tallied the highest number of votes. At the end of each podcast, Big D, Drew, and I will provide the audience with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off our respective bums. You can download Shat the Movies via iTunes, Google Play, iHeartRadio, Pandora, TuneIn, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are found. With that being said, Big D, what movie are we doing this weekend? Well, before we even get to that, I want to say this is this is a big week here. We got <laughs> Carrie Gross has passed her one year anniversary. She survived a year with us. She edited her first podcast, and now she's hosting. Who are you? I say I host the whole podcast in, a, in an ASMR whisper. <laughs> oh, we've we've gotten a lot of requests <laughs> for you to do that, and that might be a separate podcast that we do. Uh, for those of you who don't know what that is, Google it and buy yourself a good pair of headphones. <laughs> but uh, yeah, this week we have uh, it's a great category, and we've run into kind of an interesting situation that I knew would happen. Was as the categories go by, and we get some commissions. Movies are duplicated in some categories. So this category was the best of Arnold Schwarzenegger. And of the six movies, there's been a couple of them that we've already covered. So in sixth place was Last Action Hero. Already did it. Number five was Twins. Number four was The Running Man. Number three, True Lies. Number two, Total Recall. And the winner was Predator. But we already did Predator. So that means tonight we are doing the 1990 Paul Verhoeven classic, Total Recall. Yeah, I think with these movies here, there are no losers. They're all fantastic movies, and I'm I'm glad you. I loved your episode on Last Action Hero. Great flick. Twins, great movie. Running Man, True Lies, Predator, Total Recall. You can't go wrong with any of these. I was talking to Carrie in the middle of the week when we were getting ready for this, and she said, "I can remember starting when we did Conan the Barbarian, and she hated Arnold. She hated <laughs> everything Arnold stood for. And now, Carrie." You know, I think I hate the idea behind Arnold, which is this like machismo man, you know, bodybuilder, kind of plays these dumbed down roles. He's not a very serious character actor. I feel like a lot of scripts are written around his ability to act. But then I started watching these movies. (laughs) And I think that if being on Shat the Movies has gifted me anything, it's this love and appreciation for Arnold Schwarzenegger. So I'm very excited about this category. I love this movie. So uh, let's get into it. Total Recall is a 1990 American science fiction film directed by Paul Verhoeven and starring our man, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Rachel Titcoin, Sharon Stone, Ronnie Cox, and Michael Ironside. The film is loosely based on the Philip K. Dick short story, We Can Remember It For You Wholesale. The film tells the story of a construction worker who suddenly finds himself embroiled in espionage on Mars and unable to determine if the experiences are real or the result of memory implants. It was written by Ronald Shusett, Dan O'Bannon, John Pivel, and Gary Goldman and won a Special Achievement Academy Award for its visual effects. The original score, composed by Jerry Goldsmith, won the BMI Film Music Award. With a budget of 50 to 65 million, Total Recall was one of the most expensive films made at the time of its release. Although estimates of its production budget vary, and whether it ever actually held the record is not certain. We always ask, where were you when you saw this movie? We'll start with you, Big D. Uh, I can remember, again, it was my Maronick Playhouse 4. 
Uh, I saw it and loved it. But this was the first time I can remember that when I left the movie, I found myself debating with my friends about what we had seen about the nature of reality. We said, half thought this was definitely real, that Arnold, you know, that Quaid got to Mars. The other half said, hell no, this was all a dream. And it was the first time that I'd ever left the theater wondering what had the the filmmakers wanted me to think and what was reality. Even to this day, I, if you look online, you do any kind of searches, the fans are split pretty much down the middle about what we see. And at that time, it kind of blew my mind as a kid. What about you, Drew? Where were you uh, the first time you saw this movie? Yeah, I I don't remember the first time I saw it. I, I feel like the first time I saw it was on VHS, maybe like a year or two after it came out. But I had I'd forgotten quite a bit of it, actually, which is weird, because looking back, I'm like, how do you forget this movie? Uh, I remembered a few parts, but some parts like somehow like the Quado scene, uh, that one, for whatever reason, I forgot. I don't know why. But growing up, you know, if we weren't watching James Bond films, my dad and I usually would change gears and watch Arnold movies like True Lies, Eraser, Terminator 2. So uh, anytime you get to talk about uh, an Arnold movie, I am always down with that. Did you guys forget the triple boob scene? Also forgot that. <laughs> I, I I didn't even remember it. I'll be honest. I actually watched this movie like a month ago and I tweeted about it and everybody's like, oh my God, you guys got to do Total Recall. But for some reason, I didn't take any fucking notes for it. And so when this literally a month later was the next movie up to do, I'm like, Jesus, I just fucking watched this. I could have taken notes. So I wouldn't have to watch it or I could just rewatch it quickly and already have my shit in. So from now on, any movie I'm watching gets notes. I don't care if I'm in the theater, if it's a Netflix crime doc, I'm going to be prepared to shat that movie. Um, but I tweeted that I hadn't taken any notes and one listener was like, so you only have partial recall, which I thought <laughs> was, <that> was <laughs> clever. Wah, wah, wah. Well played. All right, Big D, play that trailer. Your mind. It is the center of your life. It is everything you hear. Everything you see. Everything you feel. It is everything you are. How would you know if someone stole your mind? Arrest that woman! Quaid. Cut. Get ready for a surprise! We can't let him run around. He knows too much. They've got your bug. I get a lock. There! And the bug's in your skull. Take this thing out of the case and stick it up your nose. Don't worry, it's self-guiding. Got him. I lost him. Welcome to Mars. You got a lot of nerve showing your face around here. Look who's talking. your identity and implanted a new one if i'm not me who the hell am i he's got a hologram welcome to johnny cab drive where can i take you tonight <laughs> please fasten your seat belt i want quade delivered alive for re-implantation that's for making me come to mars you wouldn't hurt me after all we're married Consider that a divorce. We hope you enjoyed the ride. In the year 2084, construction worker Douglas Quaid is having troubling dreams about Mars and a mysterious woman there. His wife, Lori, dismisses the dreams and discourages him from thinking about Mars, where the governor, Vilos Kohagen, is fighting a rebellion. At Recall, a company that provides memory implants of vacations, Quaid's opts for a memory trip to Mars as a secret agent. 
However, something goes wrong during the procedure, and Quaid starts revealing suppressed memories of actually being a secret agent. The recall employees sedate him, wipe his memory of the visit, and send him home. On the way, Quaid is attacked by his friend Harry and some other men, and is forced to kill them. He is then attacked in his apartment by Lori, who states that she isn't his wife, their marriage is a false memory implant, and Cohagen sent her to monitor Quaid. He is then attacked and pursued by armed men led by Richter, Cohagen's operative, and Lori's real husband. As I'm watching this, you know, title screen comes up, I'm getting pumped up, I got the surround sound going, and I hear the, the main theme, and I'm like, that sounds awfully familiar. So now we know that Carrie is an aficionado of everything Arnold. And she loved Conan the Barbarian. I mean, she loved it. It's right up there uh, with anything, uh, you know, any of the Twin Peaks, anything else. But I'm going to now play for you. And keep in mind that the the Total Recall score by Jerry Goldsmith won an award for best score. I'm going to start with playing you The Anvil of Crom. This is the theme of Conan, a very different movie and a different conductor. Fuck yeah. Okay, yeah, fuck yeah. You ready to... Conan's riding in, right? Okay, so now here is Total Recall. What the fuck? <laughs> yes. What? I swear, that that is an award-winning score by Jerry Goldsmith and not the original score of Conan the Bar- Bar- Barbarian by Basil Polidorus. He didn't even do Conan? I what a fucking ripoff. That motherfucker won an award for someone else's song. <laughs> Yeah. Oh bullshit! Zero wipes. I mean, five wipes. I was I was hoping you're going to punk carry and play uh, Big Guns by ACDC. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you know, this script is loosely based off the Philip K. Dick short story. It was a, supposed to be, originally be directed by David Cronenberg, who turned down the chance to do The Fly instead. And then there was plans for the sequel, which eventually became Minority Report. Minority Report is technically the sequel of Total Recall, loosely based. And Arnold Schwarzenegger was going to be in it. Imagine now Minority Report with Arnold in it instead of, you know, the amazing method actor Tom Cruise. That movie is now infinitely better if you throw Arnold in there. I know. (laughs) Picture him with the marbles. I know what's going to happen. Yeah, you talk about the Philip K. Dick short story, and it's based on the same technology. And it's, you know, questioning what your reality is. And that's the the core component. This movie right out, within 15 minutes, Arnold is at Recall. I'm assuming everybody has seen it. And Recall has the ability to implant vacations directly into your mind uh, with the additional option of an ego trip, which lets you take on some cool identities. You can be a secret agent, a sports star, a, you know, a, a, just a, a celebrity. Sounds pretty, sounds like virtual reality. I think we're, we're getting there. But it made me wonder. I'm not going to Mars or Rings of Saturn or any of that bullshit. What virtual reality vacation would you two take? I don't know if I would need to take a vacation at all. I would just like to not have to go to work and not have to dip into my PTO and just have the extra time frozen at like my own house to just clean, catch up on errands, maybe sleep in a little bit, and then just restart at work like I'd never left. That's boring as fuck. I know. <laughs> I was thinking companies would probably be down with this because you can, it's almost like you took a two week vacation, but you're really only away for like a couple hours. So I feel like they'd be like, oh, you went away, you're away on vacation. You can come back to work tomorrow. So that way you can do more work. Big D, you wouldn't have to find a babysitter. You could just <laughs> dip out for a week or two in your mind oh. and come back. And it's like, you know, Emma was just taking a little nap. Fuck. Oh, you just put me on the wrong side. What if I put Emma <laughs> into a total recall chair? And she could just be, you know, endlessly playing on a perpetual playground. And then I could take a real vacation. So it's like a babysitter. <laughs> sounds terrible. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Virtual babysitter. Yeah. That'd be great. That was the sequel to Kindergarten Cop. Starring Dolph Lundgren. <laughs> I don't want to go on a fake vacation to like the Caribbean. I recently watched the trailer for, um, I think it was, what was it called? Free Climb. That chronicles the first person to do a rope free unassisted climb of, of El Cap. I mean, it's you watch this movie and you're gripping your armchair. Watching this guy climb this giant sheer face granite and in any moment, any mistake, he'd fall. I think it'd be cool to do something like that that would be dangerous and I couldn't do. But a normal vacation uh, doesn't sound too exciting. 
Yeah. What if I was just like total recall? Can I um, have about 13 hours of sleep? Just turn it black and off and quiet. Thank you. No, I, I agree um, uh, with Big D. I feel like if you're going to do it, go somewhere that you can't normally go to, maybe like a a war-torn country where it might be dangerous to go there normally or, uh, yeah, like climbing like some mountain because I don't think my fat ass is going to make it up any mountain. That I also wouldn't mind uh, going to like Saturn. I mean, at that point, they're going to Mars anyway, so they probably know what some of these planets look like. So if there's a planet that might have like a similar – uh, ecosystem maybe where there's all kinds of cool like geog- you know geographical type things there or I don't know I think that we need to go somewhere like that in space. This sounds a little dark, but I, I think you would have a different branch of tourism. Like I would like to experience the Titanic. The last six hours, you get to have dinner. You get to, you know that you know the iceberg's coming. You can just chill out on the deck with a nice drink. It happens. You hit- watch everybody die. But. Uh, yeah, it's fun. they're going to die anyway. I would like to see how it all goes down. Just don't hang out with Rose or or any doors because you're not getting any of it. So one of the residual effects of this virtual world that you don't know is that we don't know as an audience, is this real or fake? And from the beginning, I, I lean one way. I lean that the entire thing that we see is a dream. And as we go forward, I'll try to back it up with, with specific examples. But when he goes to recall, and they're loading up his memory. One of the texts says, this is a new one, blue skies over Mars. There's no way that tech could be loading this because it's never happened. No one knew it could happen. There would be no virtual vacation with this title because it doesn't happen and it's physically impossible. So it leads me to think this entire movie is part of Quaid's journey in his vacation as his ego trip. Yeah, I agree. And and the uh, I think it was the one doctor pretty much like lays out like what happens in the movie. Like, okay, if you want to do the secret agent, you're going to be chased by people. You're going to have people shooting at you. It's going to be an adventure. Here's the girl. She's going to be was it, uh, an athletic brunette or something like that. You know, and he's like laying all of these things out and all of those things happened. So what would explain then him already having this dream of Mars you know how the movie starts. Is it just that they tapped into like a suppressed idea he already had uh, thought of? So most of the debates, people say that is it a dream or real from the point of of Quaid sitting into the chair? I think that the entire movie from the first frame is a dream. There's a little piece of music that they only play at the very beginning and the very end. It sounds like it's from Back to the Future, that like, like that little that sound whenever it's quiet in Back to the Future. They only use it twice. That first frame where he's having the dream is his first moments in the chair. So he dreams about uh, he dreams about Mars. He wakes up. He's in a new town, his wife. Then he goes to recall. Because if you went to recall and you're going on a vacation with an ego trip, you would need them to back you up to start your dream so that your mind doesn't know when the real virtual part started. So Sharon Stone, you know, after that opening scene, Arnold Schwarzenegger awakens from a dream yelling out, demure, aggressive, Mm. sleazy, honest. She's fucking dream girl. So he yells out her name and Sharon Stone is like, you know, you've been saying her name. Have you guys ever said the wrong name to anyone that you were intimate with? I, I think my problem is actually trying to remember the names of my friend's kids. Like I... For whatever reason, like I try, I actually have them written down. I have notes in my phone. Okay, here's, you know, here's my friend here. They're two kids' names. Because whenever, if I call them or text them, I'm like, I want to make sure I know who their kids' names are. Or if they come over our house, I'm like, okay, you're bringing, okay, let me guess. It's her and him. Okay, cool. We're good. So that's usually where I uh, run into issues. But no, I never uh, called an ex by the wrong name or anybody for that matter. Uh, That's an amateur move. You don't use anybody's name because you're going to get yourself caught eventually one day. You stay away from it. Okay, but I did have a close friend. I mean, this girl, she was a unicorn. He had put some work into it in a club. He was going to get her home. He gets her home. They're at the point of 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 consummation. Let's just say he's on the doorstep. She looks him in the eyes and says, what's my name? Oh, God. And he no. goes, uh, uh, Cindy, she goes, thank you very much. <gasps> Puts her clothes on and walks out. Oh, see, you know, and she should have. That's. Oh, come know her on. Name, right? Shut up. You've never you've never hooked up with a dude you didn't know his name? Yeah, hypocrite. I did one time, but we never asked each other our names. Oh, good, because you didn't. You knew the deal. 
I did find out afterwards that he was 21 years old. <laughs> yeah, the next day I was like, I have no idea what his name was. That's fine. He's 21. So we see Sharon Stone again. And, you know, one of the first movies I did with you guys was Casino. Again, another movie I didn't think I would like, but I absolutely fell in love with Sharon Stone as an actress. I think she's incredible. She's talented. She's beautiful. I feel like this role is kind of terrible for her. There's this cheesy action scenes with her. Can you imagine finding out that your wife wasn't your wife, but just a memory implanted and she's just been... I don't know, having sex with you, pretending to be your wife for the last two weeks. Yeah, as long as she looks like 1980 Sharon Stone, I think I'd get over it pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> but you said this is a bad role for her? I disagree. This role set her up in Hollywood. Paul Verhoeven saw the way and liked the way that she could flip between kind of demure and sensitive and to psychotic, violent, aggressive, strong. That's why he cast her in Basic Instinct right after this. I think she did a good job. Arnold loved her. He called her the female Terminator. You could have done a lot worse if you wanted to give Arnold, who's a construction guy. I think he did quite well with that apartment and Sharon Stone to wake up to. Verhoeven wanted her to be nude in a scene here, and she wasn't comfortable with it. So I think he later got her by casting her in Basic Instinct and showing her vagina off. I remember hearing that Verhoeven shot that scene but he had assured Sharon that you could not see anything. That motherfucker. That he tricked her in into that beaver shot. Well, she, after this came out, because she'd been like working out with Arnold and lifting weights and doing Taekwondo, she later posed for Playboy right after Total Recall came out. So, I mean, she knew she looked good yeah. and was and okay with showing her bits. But the scene where she, you know, when once he finds out that she's just been hired to be a spy to keep an eye on him, she's like, you know, you were the best assignment I ever had. You want to get kinky? And I'm thinking he should just fucking punch her right. Bam. Punches her right in the face. It was perfect. She's a terrible assassin. Arnold's in there turning off the lights. Wait for him to come out of the bathroom. Give him a hug and shoot him in the head. You didn't have to ambush him in the dark. He was completely unsuspecting that she had anything to do with it. Yeah, but didn't they need him alive, though? So I don't think she could have shot him in the head, right? Is Richter's trying to get her to kill him because Richter's obviously jealous that his love interest, Lori, has, has a, a mission to bang Arnold Schwarzenegger. Even though Cohagen said, keep him alive, if Arnold was banging my wife, I think I, I might blur the parameters of the mission. Oops. Sorry, uh, what does he do with the static? I can't hear you, Cohagen. I can't hear you. I know we've discussed it before that your wife's moral compass is so strong uh -huh. that if you had come home covered in blood that she would call the cops on you, but... Instantly. Drew, are you married? Yes. What do you think your wife would do if you came home, you're covered in blood, I've just killed somebody, they're after us, do you think she would turn you in? Or she's like a ride or die. She'd help you bury a body. Uh, well, first of all, I think it depends on who I killed. I think that's a <laughs> that's a big component of that. But I feel I feel like she would back me up. I would help anybody cover any murder. Let me tell you that. It's good to know. I'm your girl. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, so speaking of murder, when Quaid's trying to escape Richter and all his henchmen, you know, he's going up the escalator, and then he uses this like poor random guy in front of him as a human shield. There's probably other worse ways to die, but that has to be a horrible way to die. You're being used as a human shield whilst commuting to work. Also, that poor guy was shot by my count 347 times. I might I could be off by a couple, but it was insane. And then he was picked up and then thrown at people. Oh, my God. It was ridiculous. And also, by the way, gun control is a freaking joke in the future. You can just bust a cap in a crowded subway and nobody bats an eye. And per my count, several caps were, in fact, busted in this movie. Yeah, dude, he's not just a meat shield once. He's a meat shield. He's shot. He's turned around. The dude's still alive. He's flinching. He's a meat shield a second time. My notes for this block said, Quay doesn't give a fuck. Normally in these movies, right? henchmen they try not to shoot kids women no matter how bad the movie is people don't normally open up these dudes are just spraying the crowd women children everybody's going down r-rated arnold movies are definitely way better than pg or pg-13 much better the original rating for this movie was supposed to be an x rating solely based on the excessive violence 
I read that the uh, writer O'Bannon had a falling out with Verhoeven because Verhoeven replaced a lot of the satirical humor from the script with just extreme violence. And I think Arnold had a had a play in that as well, that originally the script would have been less violent. But then once you have Arnold in there, it's like, well, we got to have everything be a massive shootout and massive fight. Got to rip arms off sometime. Yeah, seriously. One of the things that kind of bugged me a little bit was the when he uh, when Arnold walked into the or Quaid, when he walked into the office, there was the, I think it was the receptionist was like changing the color of her nails with like a, like a pen or stylus or something like that. Yet the operating system and all their computers was still somehow MS DOS. <laughs> like, I don't get that. Like the inner, the inner, the interfaces on every computer system in the movie are laughable. Uh, it's like they're using like an IBM 286 and they're going to bust out a game of like Wolfenstein 3D or Commander Keen or Jumpman or something like that, or, or Blake Stone. It was terrible. You couldn't have predicted thin monitors, like flat screens. Why is everything still a giant CRT? Why do all the TVs, are they like three feet deep? Why do all the cars look like you just took a car and started like bolting on boxes and fins? I would have simplified things. I think that's the one tech that they get wrong. And I like that the, the one technology they think that they could uh, connect with the women, the female audience, is they could change their nails and all the women would be like, oh, oh, I love the future. Oh, this is going to be wonderful. No, I definitely wrote that in my notes. Like, damn, maybe I'd get my nails done if it was that easy. They got me. <laughs> After evading his attackers, Quaid has left a suitcase containing money, gadgets, fake IDs, and a video recording. The Quaid is of Quaid himself, who identifies himself as Hauser and explains that he used to work for Cohagen, but switched sides after learning about an alien artifact and underwent the memory wipe to protect himself. Hauser instructs Quaid to remove a tracking device located inside his skull before ordering him to go to Mars and check into the Hilton Hotel with a fake ID. Quaid makes his way to Mars and goes to Venezville, primary populated by people mutated as a result of poor radiation shielding. He meets Benny, a taxi driver, and Melina, the woman from his dreams, and she spurns him, believing that he is still working for Cohagen. So I've already said that I think the movie fails a lot in its prediction of technology, but it does get quite a bit correct. Dr. Lowell at, Total Re at the recall center has a tablet. There's the backscatter scanner that they have at the airport they predicted video conferencing gps i don't think the johnny cab is that far off it seems like uber or lyft will have self-driving cars within the next 10 years but it made me think people are resistant to the idea of self-driving cars do you think that they would be more comfortable that if there was like a, an animatronic driver who would talk to you than just an empty steering wheel that's kind of going as the car's driving that's without the fact that if the cab you don't pay them the fare that they try to run you over and explode without that would people like to be in a self-driving uber with a fake driver yeah i thought that driver was fantastic but uh you know they could have these fake mannequin drivers and i bet you Jameis winston would still try to grope one. Oh, yeah. sorry all the listeners in tampa bay carrie what do you think of Jameis winston love him <laughs> <laughs> There are a few Lyfts and Ubers that I've gotten into that I would rather it just be a self-driving car, whether they're just obnoxiously talking to me or barreling through crowds of people dangerously. But yeah, I, I love, though, the way that they, they simplify the world. In a lot of movies, you see it's over elaborate and you have a chance of it going wrong as the future develops. This, they use a simple design. It's basic concrete walls, simple signs. The future is clean. I like the world that they've built in the sets. It's really simple. And for me, it rings as accurate as they could have could have created in the 90s. They actually built 45 sets on eight sound stages and worked on it for over six months. 500 people worked on it for over six months. And at the time, like we said before, in 1990, this was the second most expensive film in history next to Rambo 3. But yeah, I agree with you. It's a beautiful set. I, I love all the costuming and design and props and the special effects and makeup on it. Yeah. And, and for me, the world, you know, for some reason reminded me of Demolition Man. Uh, maybe I seem to watch that again, which I would love to. Uh, it's fantastic. The cars looked very like DeLorean-esque with those. Um, it's like they all were like, like a silver or gray paint job and they had those like wing doors. How many movies will the Shat crew review with characters that have a vagina face? Because there's the one guy with a vagina face. 
<laughs> no, no, that, that, that was Foreskin Man. Uh, foresc- sorry. Foreskin Man. He looked like he had the hood. It was like the extra skin <laughs> that drooped over his eye. Like you could pull it back and his eye was there. It was just, it was under there. You. Oh my God. Do you know actually who that was? Yes. That was Hank Schrader from Breaking Bad. Speaking of the the wonderful makeup and special effects, we get this awesome scene with like a wax sculpted Arnold Schwarzenegger face pulling out his tracking device from his nose. It's a memorable scene. And it's almost like they built the head and they said, hey, we got to use this. We can't just make the eyes pop out. So they create this golf ball sized tracker which I don't know how they would think Quaid wouldn't feel it. This became even more real to me on Friday. (laughs) I go to pick up my daughter from daycare, and she tells me, Daddy, I put mulch in my nose. And I said, what do you mean? (laughs) She's like, I put mulch in my nose. So I'm like, okay, maybe she doesn't know what mulch is. I'm like, where did you put the mulch? Where did you get it? She's like, I don't know. So the story keeps changing. I'm shining a light up her nose. I'm like, there's nothing up. There's no way. I drive home. Daddy, there's mulch in my nose. I'm like, I just looked, Emma. There's no mulch in your nose. I shine the light again. She says, let's get it out. I call my favorite resident nurse, Carrie Gross. <laughs> and I said, Carrie, should I like shoot water up the other nostril? What should I do? She said, keep having her blow it. So I'm like, all right. Next half an hour, story keeps changing. It's not mulch. Then it, she didn't do it. She doesn't know what mulch is. Finally, after about three hours, I hold the other nostril, get her to blow four or five times, and out comes what looked like maybe one-sixth of a pencil. That size of mulch had been up her nose. She goes, oh, that feels much better, Daddy. (laughs) Well, I like that you're texting me about it, and you're like, what should I do? I'm freaking out. I can't see it. And I'm thinking, you know, kids don't – you know, lead with logic and reason at that age that, you know, maybe her nose just hurts. And for some reason she's saying that, but I'm also like, why would a three-year-old know what mulch yeah, is? Yeah. And then you'd mentioned that the teacher had said, well, she had knocked heads with another kid. And so her nose just kind of hurts. So I'm like, continue to watch it. Don't shoot anything up the nose. It could push it further. But in my head, I'm thinking, I bet you she doesn't have anything up there. It's just her nose is hurting. And for some reason, she's saying mulch. And a couple hours later, you just send me a picture. No no response, just a picture of this piece of nastiest oh. mulch on a paper towel. And I'm like, well, I guess she was right. She knew what she was talking about. Yeah, and if she knew that this slimy piece of mulch was up her nose, how Quaid wouldn't have sensed this golf ball in his sinuses? I don't know if you guys know this, but you can actually die from a nosebleed. And occasionally we'll get patients in the hospital that have had their nose bleeding for several hours, several days. And what is happening is they can actually have like a small um, aneurysm and that they'll need to have it carterized. And uh, in the meantime, what we have to do is we call it tamponade where you hold pressure down on a bleed. And so the only way to get up into where the artery or the, the vessel that's bleeding is you, we have this device called a rhino rocket and it kind of looks like a like a tampon. You inject it into the nose, and then there's a balloon in it, and you inflate it with air. And what it does is it just expands in the nose. And occasionally, we'll have enough time to sedate the patient to do this because it's extremely uncomfortable. Imagine like the worst sinus pressure you could imagine. But the last time I had to do it, this lady was bleeding so bad that she was actually – Uh, asphyxiating on the blood and we had to inject it and inflate it with her wide awake and the scene of him pulling out and he's like it was like that but without a wax sculpted face it's a fucking nightmare did you say when when you hear the crunch you know it's there (laughs) i'm sorry honey i just have to inject a little more air when you hear the crunch you'll know it's there how the heck did uh, Quaid get that towel to stay on his head? Was it Hauser told him, you know, put the first of all, does would that even work? Like, no, you figure this is like what 2084, there's no way that <laughs> would block the signal. And then also, how does he actually get it to stay on his head? He's like moving around, like evading henchmen, and, and the towel stays on his head. Like, I'm pretty good. So, when we had both of our daughters, I got really good at like wrapping like the little swaddling outfit around them. I was pretty good at that, but even then, they would still break free once in a while. And they also were not running away from henchmen. So I don't know what kind of trick he used to get that thing to stay on there. I was impressed. When you're first swaddling, it's a mess. It comes untucked. It's, it would be all of this. And I know I'm fucked up and I wish he was here to defend himself. I actually immediately thought I would pay money to see Gene Lyons 
put a wet towel turban on his head. Come on, Carrie. You tell me you wouldn't want to see that? You're shaking your head? Oh, come on. <laughs> I wish I had the video of her face. <laughs> Quaid later encounters Dr. Edgemar and Lori, who claim Quaid has suffered a schizoid embolism and is trapped in a fantasy based on the implanted memories. Edgemar warns that Quaid is headed for a lobotomy if he does not return to reality, then offers Quaid a pill that would waken him from the dream. Quaid puts the pill in his mouth but sees Edgemar sweating. Realizing he's awake, he kills Edgemar and spits out the pill. Richter's men then burst into the room and capture Quaid, but Melina rescues him, with Quaid killing Lori in the process. Melina and Quaid race back to Veniceville and escape into the tunnels with Benny. Unable to locate Quaid, Cohagen shuts down the ventilation to Veniceville, slowly asphyxiating its citizens. Quaid, Melina, and Benny are taken to a resistance base, and Quaid is introduced to Quaido. Quaido reads Quaid's mind and tells him that the alien artifact is a turbinium reactor that will create a breathable atmosphere for Mars, eliminating Cohagen's monopoly of breathable air. Benny reveals that he works for Cohagen whose forces burst in and kill most of the resistance, including Cueto. So I'm glad. Again, the movie, it's flying by. 15 minutes, we're in recall. 45 minutes, we're on Mars already. We didn't even see how he got on an interstellar rocket. And it got me wondering, you can build a rocket to Mars that flies commercial passengers, but you can't make bulletproof glass in the actual arrival center or storm doors that drop What's going on with the technology? It seems like if you were going to create a, a society on a different planet that didn't have, you know, breathable air, and you created it in this dome-like area, that you would want it to be an impenetrable substance. I wish I saw what the uh, casting call looked like. We're looking for an unattractive, obese, middle-aged woman to play Quaid in the mask. <laughs> How did he not get caught in the scanner? But then the mask malfunctions. It says two weeks. It explodes. There's a lot of convenient <laughs> things that are going on in the plot that lead to believe it has to be all part of that vacation dream. There's no way, no way that the people could be this inept. Yeah, and and one of the things. Uh, so Richter turns around and he notices, you know, this, you know, large woman, you know, kind of repeating herself, like, and he just like, like immediately he's like that's Quaid. There he is. And it's like, but that could just be a lady who's maybe having some kind of seizure or maybe like a, like, it's like, it's like a, it's like a, <laughs> it's like, a like a tick. Maybe she has like Tourette's or some, some kind of, you know, mental two episode. Weeks. Two yeah. weeks. I mean, I, I'm, I probably say things like that at work every day. I mean, luckily Richter doesn't work with me because he'd shoot me right away. They have a, probably had like two or three passengers before this where he's like, no, no, that's Quaid. That's Quaid. They kill him. Oh shit. I'm going to get him one of these times. But yeah, all of Quaid's henchmen and throughout the entire movie, they're all inept. You got 90% of his henchmen and shoulders can't hit anybody. They shoot at least 500 rounds and they just, they don't even, they hit the walls and any kind of metal banisters. Later in the movie, even there's an ambush where they get Cohagen's hologram. The soldiers are all standing in a circle, maybe 15 feet apart. They unload on each other full auto. Nobody hits a single person. But Hauser and Richter, they're doing headshots all day long. They're shooting people on the subway. Uh, you got Hauser shooting his wife in the head. They even managed to shoot baby mutant Quado. And that was a tough shot. Yeah, it's like an episode of The Walking Dead. Like somehow every, like all those people are like amazing headshots. Do you think this is just further proof that this is a dream? That they can't be killed they don't shoot anybody, but they can make perfect headshots the entire time. Is this just further proof that this is like a simulation? Uh, I think it's just too many coincidences, too many long odds that would have to happen and unrealistic situations that make you think the end is inevitable. But that that's just me. Yeah, I think also later on when they're in the control room, I think it was, Cohagen says, or he said it was too perfect. And Cohagen's like, it wasn't perfect. So I feel like he realizes like it was like almost like everything was kind of set up perfectly. I feel like that's even more evidence. So Carrie, I agree. I think them being as amazing as they are with these like headshots and just everything else and their overall skill, I, f I feel like it does feed into the fact that it is in fact a dream. You mentioned the fat lady suit, <laughs> large, large lady. lady suit. And this is when... When when we land on Mars, we start to see all of this wonderful makeuping and special effects with all the mutants and the large lady. Then we get to see the three-breasted 
hooker, which was originally I read was originally supposed to have four breasts, but I guess the producers thought it looked too much yeah. like cow udders. But I was trying to figure out who the actress was. She didn't do much press about the movie or publicity about it because I guess she found the experience playing that character so humiliating that she felt like she was exposing her real breasts. If you look closely in some of the scenes, I mean, she's smiling, but you could see below the surface that she's like near tears. And I just feel awful for her that she found the thing so degrading. But it's such a quintessential character for this movie. When they did the Recall remake in 2012, that they brought a similar character back. But but wait, so I imagined that she was very flat chested and that the three breasts were all prosthetic. They didn't just pull the two apart and put a third one in the middle, did they? No, all three are prosthetic, but you can, I mean, she could be wearing something on top of her breasts that she was wearing something on top of her breasts that's all prosthetic, but she felt so humiliated that she felt like she was showing her But she didn't feel boobs. humiliated about the scene where the, the taxi driver, what was his name? Penny? When the camera pans back, he's sitting there playing with her nipples and then just leaves. Yeah, she was humiliated. We also get to see the slimy gut baby for the first time. I completely forgot about him. I mean, not from the month ago that I watched it, but from previous times watching it. And why is he slimy? Was he inside the man's stomach and then came out? Or has he just been living underneath the shirt and hiding? What the fuck? Did anyone else think that was weird? Like, why is he slimy and gross? That's like, yeah, the whole the whole thing to me was also weird. And I also somehow of all the scenes forgot that one that the guy had like a little small alien living in his belly. Basically, I'm like, I don't understand that. But yeah, I, he was slimy. I'm like, maybe he is inside his belly. I don't know. That's kind of weird. Drew, you're, you're <laughs> old like me. You remember Basket Case? Yes. I think because when 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 Quada was coming out, there's almost like a convulsion like it's. There's some physical, he's not just unbuttoning his shirt and like, hey, here's Quato. Hey, yeah. yeah, maybe he's in it, but also running around Mars with a with a flannel button down. That would be hot. You'd have to keep baby Quato like a lot of lotion to keep the skin soft. Well, and you notice that after he has the convulsion that like the the actual standing human being almost becomes like unconscious. Yeah. It's like only one mind works at a time. Very bizarre. It's not like he's an appendage or a twin that is conjoined. It's that either he controls the living large human or he's this little entity hanging off of his gut. Very weird, but... It's like a host. I still love it. I mean, it seems cheesy and the makeup is kind of awful, but also awful in a good way. I like it. I found myself surprisingly revulsed where Quato, who has that voice, like... Hold my hands. Hold. And he puts out like those those little like cut. And I half thought that, that Quaid was going to be like, no, thank you. No, no. I love, he just goes right for it. I'm right like, for God, him. Please, please, please don't hold. Open your mind. And then I was praying, please don't yank those little arms off. Don't, don't pull around. Yeah, that's not, that's not until later. Oh. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so speaking of trying to keep uh, Quado, uh, lubed up and, and hydrated uh they still have pepsi and and barks on mars i think when quaid was uh, uh being attacked by Lori in like the hallway of the was the hilton i think it was uh they had like a soda machine there and they had pepsi and, and apparently they also have barks on mars which is which is good because i do love a good root beer i was kind of hoping that the future would have crystal pepsi brought back but i don't think that's going to happen so that kind of sucks they they came out with Crystal Pepsi like last year as like a throwback thing, a retro throwback thing. Yeah, it, uh, it, it, it didn't stay though, which made me sad. And I think it also came out, it also came out after this movie. I think Crystal Pepsi was like 93 or something like that, 94. This movie was 1990. Yeah, true. So, so wait, you, you didn't go out and hoard like cases of Crystal Pepsi? I didn't Pepsi? even know. When I, I went to like Target one day and then they had like one of those like uh, kiosks full of them. I was like, hell yeah. So I grabbed a couple. Uh, and I figured I would have another opportunity to to get more. And it wasn't long after that that they were they was gone. I'm like, are you kidding me? So I was I was a little sad about that. I'm embarrassed to say this that my father was a a classic Coke fanatic to the point where when new Coke was announced, he went on a a shopping spree to any classic Coke he could find. I remember our garage was floor to ceiling with two liter bottles. And I'm talking, Maybe 600, 700, close to 1,000. 
Shut the front door. I swear, he survived New Coke. I remember when classic, and it was probably, I don't know, maybe a year. Again, I'm just, you know, spitballing it here. I remember classic Coke hit the shelf and he was down to his final six bottles. So he was an early prepper in the Coke (laughs) apocalypse. Coke in the two liter bottles is gross. Like as soon as you open it, it goes flat. Yeah, I'm a can, a, can all the way. Yeah, he's got a problem. I did read when I was reading some of the fan reviews that people pick out things, you know, that we wouldn't normally see. I guess Coke was sold on Earth and Pepsi was Mars. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Really? When he was um when he was in the uh, like the street, they had the billboards. There was Coke, there was Fuji Film. Uh, I think Philips was another one. Uh then in Mars, mm-hmm. I think they had was it Jack in the Box and like another store, a uh, sharper image. I think it was, there was like a couple of stores that apparently still make it to 2084. So that's good. How about some fashion throwbacks that we all wish would come back? Uh, come back. I'm still living it, kiddo. <laughs> uh, and, and judge me all you want, but I, <laughs> kiddo. <laughs> I love that Arnold was wearing cargo pants. Those things were huge in the late nineties and early two thousands. Like a lot of, I remember like all the new metal bands that wear them. I think even like Backstreet Boys and NSYNC would have them, but I hope they make a comeback because I, I I absolutely love them. Cargo pants and cargo shorts. And when you have kids, those things are a godsend. You know, you have to have like a like a specific setup, right? You have diapers in one pocket, a wallet in another. I got my phone in another pocket. I got keys in another one. And I even get to that small pocket by my left knee or my back pocket. So uh, just all I got to say is a quick tip. Uh, make sure you have a quality belt to hold it all together. Oh, yeah. So instead of cargo pants, it's like daddy diaper bag pants? Uh, Pretty much, yeah. You just don't have to have a bag, which that works. It's functional, man. But I thought of it. That looked like a Dockers commercial when when Quaid is walking into the recall office. They do a nice, long, establishing shot of him with all the pockets. You can see him down the leg, the back. And it made me think. They're in every Arnold mover. Commando, Total Recall. He wears them also in, uh, fuck, what's the other one we just recently did? Oh, predator. predator. Yeah, Predator, of course. He's rocking them. They they're very useful, but are they are they out of fashion, Carrie? Please say uh, no. Please say no. No. Thank you. I mean, <laughs> were they ever in fashion to begin with? I'm thinking that he has to wear them cuz what kind of other pants could Arnold wear on those hamstrings? He could wear those uh those Z Z cat what were those? The Z the one with the zebra the zoo, patterns? The Zubas. Oh Zubas. No, the Zubas. Yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. <laughs> no, I think they're functional and they're but your hesitation to tell me that they're not out of style or in style makes me worried about my collection of cargo shorts. What do I know? I dress like an old lady. He's a secret agent. I, I feel like most secret agents probably should wear them. I know James Bond wears like a suit, which I, I mean, whatever. He probably has like special pockets built into his suit, but cargo pants are fantastically functional for a secret agent or anybody for that matter. Yeah, construction worker. That's, that's what he does for work. Moving on. <laughs> Quaid and Melina are taken to Cohagen, who explains that Quaid's persona was a ploy by Hauser to infiltrate the mutants and expose Quaido, thereby wiping out the resistance. Cohagen orders Hauser's memory to be reimplanted in Quaid and Melina programmed as Hauser's obedient wife. But Quaid and Melina escape into the mines where the reactor is located. Benny attacks them in an excavation machine, but Quaid kills Benny. Quaid and Melina then outwit and kill Richter and his men lying in ambush for them. Yeah, I was personally shocked that Benny was a race traitor, that he could turn on his mutant family <laughs> and side with the, with the normal humans was bullshit. And you could see the despair in the mutant community as that happened. He didn't even have five kids. But the other disappointment as far as villains here is Cohagen. He's got this elaborate plan. For a year out, he planned this elaborate. We're going to take Hauser. He's already gotten close. We're going to then wipe his mind, put him back on earth, a fake wife, a fake job. We're going to let him then go to recall, have his memories partly come back. Then he goes back to Mars. This is a year-long plan. But yet, like a typical Bond villain, he makes the mistake. He's got Quaid and Molina strapped in the chair. Why are you leaving the room? Why don't you just stand there for 20 seconds and watch them get wiped? See you at the party. (laughs) So in 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 Benny's defense, 
and, and so I have two kids and I feel like things are kind of it's it's good, but I feel like it's it's enough. Two is a good number. I feel like when you get to four, I feel like maybe he legitimately thought he might have had five. I feel like he's probably just like four or five. I don't know. <laughs> I, so I, I think that was I think that was a legitimate um, mistake on his part. I don't think he had any kids. I think he was just uh, trying to hustle some money. Yeah, no, but that definitely was uh, going back to the the bond portion. I feel like uh, that would have been great from like uh, an Austin Powers skit. Like just just kill him, just freaking kill him. Don't have to lay out the whole plan. Just kill him. But yeah, that, that's exactly like every Bond movie. Just just hang out there for a minute, thirty seconds, and then he ends up getting so pissed off, he goes back to his office and kicks his damn fish tank. Oh uh, yeah, and that's that's what I don't understand. Like first, so also, why did he do that? I don't. I think that I feel like that was uncalled for. But when the fish are on the ground, did that remind either of you of that Faith No More video for Epic from like 1990 or 91 around that same time? Carrie has no idea what you're talking about. I know who Faith No More is. The video, you know what he's talking about. I'm gonna Google it. Oh, here we go. I know who Faith No More is. They're amazing. Yeah, but the other thing is, don't don't you imagine that human or like Earth goldfish would be valuable on Mars? Why? You got to import them. You got to import them. They're not from there. Anything on Mars. It's like Hawaii. Anything in Hawaii is more expensive. Gas, milk, because you got to get it to the island. Anything in Mars should be more expensive. Oxygen. <laughs> yeah, especially oxygen. You know, the yeah. air. Huh? I'm, uh, googling that. I'm, I'm gonna narrate. I'm fast so, forwarding. So Carrie right now is googling Faith No More Epic. She's looking at her screen and wondering. I'm gonna turn this sound on. She is fast forwarding a bit. She's seeing it. Her head is nodding. She's hearing it. You want it all, but you can't it have it. Okay. Now go to the end. Such a good song. Yes, yeah, towards the end of the video. Okay, I'm fast forward. There's an eyeball and a hand. Oh, oh, I remember now. Oh, fuck. He's sitting down to play the piano. Oh, now she's looking a little disgusted. Or she has Uh-oh. to poop. Look at her face. That's a oh, real she's... fish. Yep, she's rubbing her <gasps> upper lip. Oh, she's sitting she's... Call Peter. I'm watching a <laughs> fucking fish voice... suffocate. Yes, he's suffocating. For a fucking yeah. music video. And I'm old enough to remember that there was a to controversy. a piano that... solo. That PETA, I believe, protested and there was a big debate. And MTV, I think, for some of the copies, they actually removed it from their uh, the version that they played so that the ending was different because people were upset. Yeah, could you imagine if they were choking a cat? If the end of that video was like him squeezing yeah. the life out of a cat. I'm going to start a spinoff chat on animal cruelty in movies. And we just talk about the horrible things that directors and producers have put animals through. Anyway, kicking that fish tank. How dare they? Bastards. So uh, I, I know I mentioned before about Arnold and you know how, you know, uh, when I was younger, my dad and I would always love watch his movies. I have a ridiculous amount of respect for Arnold. Have, have I don't know if either of you guys or any of your listeners seen that Arnold Schwarzenegger 30 for 30. I think it was a 30 for 30 short. So it was like 10 or 15 minutes. And I think it was called like Arnold's Blueprint or something like that. If you haven't watched it, check it out. It's amazing. But Arnold in there, he talks about uh, this guy, Reg Parker, who was kind of his inspiration. Uh, He was a bodybuilder. He turned actor. He played Hercules. Um, And and, and Arnold's dad, you know, he was a police officer. They had humble beginnings. And when Arnold was 18, his dad enlisted him in the military. And then Arnold was, you know, kind of fixated on being a bodybuilder and then, you know, kind of transitioning into being an actor. And he said he would do whatever it takes to reach that goal. I mean, he would do his daily responsibilities, which was insane. He would clean guns. They would march like 20 miles a day. He said, you know, getting up at 5 a.m. to go running. And then when everyone else would go to bed at night, completely wiped out and and rightfully so, he would work out for three more hours. And then one night he left the barracks and took like a five-hour train ride to a bodybuilding competition, you know, risking punishment by his officials uh, which turned out to be several days in solitary confinement, but he wound up winning that competition. But, and the whole story is, you know, really amazing. Uh, and then after that, the military actually kind of chipped in to help him reach his goals. It was kind of neat how they kind of, you know, uh, you know, worked around him and, you know, really, you know, supported him. It was, it was really neat. I highly recommend that, uh, that 30 for 30, if you haven't seen it. Yeah. I think one of the worst thing people can do is to discount him as a, a meathead that he's just a brainless action star to come from where he has in his life and to what he has accomplished the odds are stacked against him it's much like total recall like there's no way that shit could have happened 
you know, a boy growing up in that small town to become one of the biggest stars in the world and the governor of California, that shit doesn't happen. Quaid reaches the reactor control room where Cohagen is waiting with a bomb. During the ensuing struggle, Cohagen triggers the bomb, but Quaid throws it away, blowing out one of the walls of the control room and causing an explosive decompression. Cohagen is sucked out onto the surface where he suffocates and dies. Quaid manages to activate the reactor before he and Melina are pulled out and begin to experience the decompression effects. Right before they die, the reactor releases air into the atmosphere, saving Quaid, Melina, and the rest of the Mars population. As humans walk onto the surface of the planet, Quaid momentarily pauses to wonder whether he is dreaming or not before turning to kiss Melina. So there's been multiple times throughout this entire uh, mission to Mars and to get to the point where they're in the reactor. He should have died multiple times. And all of a sudden, I realized I'd totally forgotten about the best piece of spy technology that he had was that hologram bracelet. That thing is badass. It would have come in handy about four times before <laughs> this. What the fuck was he waiting for to use this? I was so confused by that scene because, you know, when they first show it, it is clearly not a hologram. It is him there. And then they turn it to a hologram in the next scene. But I was so confused because my exact thought was that. Why would he now be using the hologram when he could have been doing it this entire fucking time? <laughs> yeah. Why would they pull this card yeah. now? Uh, no, no. So they're using the hologram in that room where the um, the hell was that thing called? Uh, the reactor. Ah, uh, reactor. Yeah, yeah. So they used it in the circle jerk, and then they used it where <laughs> she she pretended. And, and but that technology, it's great. The hologram's fantastic, right? But now the question of the technology of that Martian terraformer, the reactor, does that work? Yeah, I don't, I don't know if that Marsh that the um that reactor would actually work. Like I know it releases, you know, breathable air and I'm not, you know, Neil Tyson Degrassi here, but what about like the atmosphere? Like, does it actually like encapsulate everything? Like would the breathable air just leave the planet? I'm not a rocket scientist. I don't know those <laughs> things, but that's what I'm asking. Right. Like also if they breathe the same air as us and these Martians created this, obviously these Martians are insanely smart. Did the Martians think to come to earth if they share the same, you know, uh, like oxygen that we do? If so, are there Martians here now? Are also are we Martians? Uh, well, Drew, I, I hate to to ruin your bubble. No, this is not how terraforming works. I did some research <laughs> at the end of the okay. So yes, terraforming is potential. You could do it, but the process that they use and to have it create a breathable atmosphere in minutes so that everybody can climb out of the dome would not happen. It would take lifetimes to slowly change the the environment. I think they said that on Mars, there's less than 0.01% oxygen. So we're talking multiple lifetimes. But even that wouldn't stop the pressure difference of the atmosphere. All the humans would still pop out there without their, their spacesuits. So it leads me more and more towards, since the science is completely on the side of this is physically impossible, I don't care that it's alien technology because it's still essentially a rod melting a glacier. There's no way this is real. <laughs> I was also questioning along my notes from Crimson Tide. I kept some for this as well. Like, do glaciers release O2? But beyond that, when they're rolling down the dune of Mars and land down there and, you know, Arnold is doing his signature scream, why are their eyes bulging out of their head? I've seen a lot of people suffocate and, you know, their faces just turn blue and they basically are choking. Is it just for effect? Yeah. So uh, I have actually two things there. So first off, I would think that their eyes would not bulge out of their heads. I could be wrong on that, but <laughs> I feel like it would just kind of asphyxiate and call it a day. But um, also, right. So let's say that was the case, right? So let's say your eyes did bulge out and everything was a mess when the uh, when the oxygen came back. Right. Their bodies like just kind of went back to normal. I wouldn't like their eyes kind of stay as they were, or if they exactly reverted a little bit, it it might get a little bit better, but it would you would there would definitely be something that's like noticeable there. Well, have you guys ever seen the scientific experiment where you put a marshmallow in a vacuum? No, nope. It grows to about six times the size by reducing the pressure in the atmosphere. All the soft tissue would expand. So your eyes, your tongue, according to what I've read. This, of course, it wouldn't look like this. You wouldn't be screaming and flailing around. 
it would kind of just be uncontrollable, like that old toy you used to squeeze and the eyes would pop out. Oh. That your eyes and everything, those are the softest tissues, would expand until they popped and then the fluid would just drain out of you. Well, that would be funny that once they had oxygen restored, you know, in that last scene where they're kissing, if their yeah. tongues and their eyes were still just like swollen and bulging <laughs> from their face and they had to live that way. That'd be great. Do you think this was a dream? <laughs> <laughs> it reminds me of um oh what was it uh, indiana jones and the raiders of the lost ark i feel like at the very end when like when they, everybody's like eyes like bulge out and they like melt for some reason that's what i thought of when i saw that scene yeah i want to know who has that prosthetic head you know somebody has that that deserves to be on your mantle like somewhere in a bookcase <laughs> that's one of the props in, in in movie history i'd want is it in that airport with a uh... Hoggle from Labyrinth. Oh yeah, the the uh, the Museum of Lost Luggage in South Carolina. I don't know, maybe it is. But as we're coming here to the close of the movie, I just want to kind of go over the steps along the way and why I think it's definitively this was a dream, and then I think the dream starts from frame one. And Drew had mentioned it early on. Everything that Recall promised as part of the package has happened. We've just added ancient alien artifacts. I don't want to spoil it for you, Doug, but rest assured, by the time the trip is over, you'll get the girl, kill the bad guys, and save the entire planet. The tech statement. That's a new one. Blue skies over um, over Mars. Yeah, so Hauser says, it's too good to be true. It's like a dream, to which Melina responds, so kiss me before you wake up. Then there's a white light. White light always, always represents an awakening. Black is death. And maybe you could say, go to the light if you're dying. But the white, I think, represents that he's waking up. There's no doubt in my mind that what we have seen from frame one to the very last frame is part of his ego trip. Yeah. And and, and yeah, the doctor at the beginning basically lays out everything that happens. And then I think uh, Big D might have mentioned before, but was it Dr. Was it Edgemar? Mm-hmm. Um, he also kind of tells him what's going to happen kind of moving along as well. So I think there's like a few trails that they kind of you know lay things out for everybody uh, along the way so yeah i'm i think i'm with you on that it's, it's a dream i read that verhoven intentionally left it with a white light because he wanted to leave some questions regarding whether it was a dream or if he in fact was like lobotomized at the end so even he hasn't really clarified what the ending is leaving it open for interpretation yeah, and I think that's one of the things that makes the movie great is everyone can see what they want and that we're still talking about this. You know, how many years later? 28 years later? Almost. Yeah. yeah. Almost 30 years. It's crazy. Yeah. It's totally plausible. Very realistic. I think it was all real. <laughs> I, I love your case there, Roger. Way to defend it. Was not a dream. <laughs> All right, so now's the time of the podcast where we decide the scores that we give this movie. How our scoring system works is a zero wipe movie is a perfect movie. It's a perfect simulation of a dream where you shoot every single enemy directly in the head and end up restoring oxygen to a mutant planet and kissing the girl of your dreams. A five wipe movie is the worst movie you could imagine. It's breaking through a thin layer of glass rolling down a hill into a sandy Mars dunes and suffocating to death while your eyes are bulging out of your head. So with that being said, Big D, Dick Ebert, what do you give this movie? Uh, I'm kind of surprised to say it. I, I really, really enjoyed this movie. Is it as good as Predator? No, but it blazes along. Like I said, 19 minutes, we're already a total recall. He's having a seizure. 45 minutes were on Mars. It was nonstop action. It was fun. It was Arnold at his bloodiest. He takes it to a new level. When he rips out the armrest of that the chair the second time he's at recall, and he plunges that jagged aluminum like shaft into a tech's neck. It was <laughs> glorious. It was violent. It was off the handle. In my notes, I wrote, this shit went crazy. It went crazy real quick. It's enjoyable. Is it his best? No, but we're still talking about it 30 years later. I can't come up with anything that would make it better. It's it's Verhoeven at his best. Uh, and I for me, I got I to gotta say it's a one wipe. So one wipe for Big D. What about you, Drew? So uh, to me, this movie uh, is kind of like a roadhouse. It's almost like a, a guilty pleasure. You know, him ripping off Richter's arms. It's like, it's like Dalton 
ripping out someone's throat. Uh, completely superfluous, but I'm glad they did it. Uh, insane amounts of violence, which is, is great. Uh, just don't have your kids watch it. There's a couple decent Arnold one-liners in there, like relax, you'll live longer and consider that a divorce. I always love Arnold one-liners. I feel like from that standpoint, this is one of his weaker movies, but it was still good. It's And I think Big D was saying, is it his best work? No, but that doesn't mean it's bad. Uh, the movie also flew by almost, it was almost what, two hours? I think it was like an hour and 50 or somewhere on there. So almost two hours. It really seemed like 90 minutes to me. A couple of things that bug me, like some of the special effects, I feel like looked a little dated to me, but there was so much action in there. Uh, it, it made you think a little bit as well. Like, was it a dream? Was it reality? So I had a lot going for it. I think I have to give it a 1.5 wipe. So a wipe and a half for me. I have to agree with both of you that I felt that the movie flew by pretty quickly. It is based off of, you know, one of my favorite sci-fi authors, Philip K. Dick. So I have to give it props for that. I do like the score, even though now I'm finding out it was a total fucking ripoff of Conan the Barbarian. I like the special effects. I They are dated. Uh, the costumes and the props is all dated. But I feel like it gives it this kind of Hollywood blockbuster charm. They still use the large scale uh, miniatures and special effects with CGI. And I feel like it was one of the last movies to kind of do that. It's one of my favorite genres, dystopian, sci-fi, thriller. I'd have to say adding Arnold to it kind of makes it a thrillomedy with with those one-liners that he has, that he's smirking in a lot of it. It's hard to take him seriously. You know, the concept with a fat lady face was great, but the execution of it has that cheesiness. And I, I love that. I feel like they could have put another actor in besides Arnold and made it more of kind of an intellectual movie, but that in its sense would make it a completely different movie. So I have to see it for what it is. I love Arnold. I love the movie. It could have been better, but for what it is, it's great. I would watch it again. I'm going to give it 1.75 wipes. So with Big D's one wipe, Drew's 1.5 wipes, and mine 1.75, that averages out to a 1.416 repeating where does that put us on our chat pantheon of movies? Again, it always kind of seems to work out with a 1.4166 repeating. That puts it in the 32 spot. It is a little bit worse than The Matrix, Big Trouble in Little China, Last Action Hero. And it is a little bit better than Friday the 13th, Spaceballs, and Scrooged. I would have to agree with that. The only difference I would, the only thing I would say is Spaceballs, I think is a much better movie. I love Spaceballs. Oh, have it's you okay. watched that recently? Spaceballs? Yes. Uh, I a handful of months ago, yeah. I, I, okay, I'll watch it again. The movie's fantastic. Ugh. You're one of them. <laughs> I'm, I'm surrounded by assholes. <laughs> did you, uh, did you, did either of you guys see the 2012 remake of Total Recall? Was it Colin, Colin Farrell, Farrell in it? Yeah. No. I, so I did not see it. I don't know if you guys saw it. I, I did not. have zero interest in seeing that. No, did not see it. I, I can't imagine it working with Colin Farrell. I, I've heard it got pretty bad reviews, but. I don't even think he goes to Mars. Oh, really? It got a 31% on Rotten Tomatoes. Yikes. Yeah. There we have it. So that concludes this episode of our review of Total Recall. Big D, what is going to be our next movie? So we have a commission from one of our listeners, from Vincent. And since Major League Baseball is opening up on this day, we will be covering the 1984 baseball classic. On the way to a tryout with the Chicago Cubs, young baseball phenom Roy Hobbs, played by Robert Redford, is shot by an unstable Harriet Byrd, played by Barbara Hershey. After 16 years, Hobbs returns to pro baseball as a rookie for the last place New York Knights. Despite an early agreement with the manager Pop Fisher, played by Wilford Brimley, Hobbs becomes one of the best players in the league, and the Knights start winning. But this upsets the judge, Robert Prosky, their owner, who wants Hobbs to lose the game, not win. It was released on May 11th, 1984. It was directed by Barry Levinson, and it was one of my favorite baseball movies growing up. So stay tuned to the credits and hear what this movie will be. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We are on Twitter, Snapchat, Instagram at Shat the Movies, Facebook at shatthemovies.com slash Facebook. You can email us at hosts at shatthemovies.com. If you want to support our podcast, you can donate through PayPal, Venmo. You can use our Amazon link to shop, which is shatthemovies.com slash Amazon. 
be sure if you haven't already to complete the survey at shatthemovies.com slash survey. That'll help us find some sponsorship. We're everywhere fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please, please leave us a five-star review. That helps our podcast grow. You can also check out our sister podcast, uh, Shat on TV, where we review television series such as Westworld, Taboo, True Detective, and now American Gods. You can find all that information on our website, shatontv.com. On behalf of my co-hosts, Big D, Dick Ebert, and our guest, Drew, I'm Carrie Gross. Be sure to join our next podcast for the following movie. Someday when people look at me, they'll say, there goes Roy Hobbs, the best there ever was. TriStar Pictures presents Robert Redford in The Natural, the story of a father and a son. you got a gift, Roy, but it's not enough. Of love. He means the world to me. And desire. I'm not waiting for true love to come along, Roy. A champion. A Roy Hobbs comes along once, maybe twice in everybody's lifetime. And his destiny. With or without the records, they'll remember you. Best there is now, and best there ever will be. I wouldn't bet against me. I already have. Robert Redford. Robert Duvall. Glenn Close. Kim Basinger. Wilford Brimley. Barbara Hershey, Robert Prosky, and Richard Farnsworth has read The Natural. Emma, what should you put up your nose? Nothing. What should you put in your ears? Nothing. Good answer. What was up your nose at school? Mulch. Oh, no. (laughs) Mulch. And how did we get it out? With, um, with paper. Yep, so you blew your nose, and then it came out, and did you feel better? Yes. Okay, no more mulch. Tell people, don't put things in your nose.